So hi everyone, uh, my name is Yi Chen, and then uh, today uh, for the first talk, I will speak on behalf of uh, Anjali, and who is uh, PI working in the Nature History Museum in UK, and then she's uh, main research interest is in uh, morphology evolution. Okay, so the next slides will be like a, an advertisement for <laughs> Linear Society, which uh, Anjali is currently the president of Linear Society, and then. Uh, you're welcome to uh, submit paper to this journal. But although it's slightly sarcastic, it's the, the reason Angela cannot be here this week is she's giving a, a lecture in the Linear Society, so maybe I shouldn't post this at the time. But anyway, so, so uh, even Darwin and, uh, and uh, Wallace submitted their uh, manuscript of the Nature Selection to the, this journal. And uh, although, but I think Darwin can be a, a bit more um, confident. <laughs> it's, uh, Fish up, yes. Awesome. And uh, so, okay. So here's the plot. I think uh, uh, Sarah showed yesterday, similarly, right? There's uh, such a uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, biodiversity uh, across the world, and then it's like a ve there's very different uh, across time, uh, like location and the, like the tree of life. So, and then we want to understand like what shape uh, the diversity over a large scale, like uh, global, globally. And so to understand the, this diversity, oh sorry, to understand this di diversity, so the, the lab uh, mainly used the uh, phenomics uh, to quantify the, the, uh, the trait of like say uh, animal and organism. For, for example, this is example of the skulls uh, of, uh, of different animals scattering around the world. And uh, so we are interested in the trait and the characteristic of them and then measuring them to study the relationship with other individuals and uh, to co try to correlate it with uh, other uh, ecological factors. And thanks to the collection in house of many museums and institutes, so we can have access to like tons of fossils, which as you can see here, this is example, there are more like extinct family than uh, extinct family in the, in the mammals and uh, in the, in the tra te tetrapods. And so, which shows the importance of using fossils. And by uh, uh, utilizing the fossils, we can understand more the evolution in deep time. I think, like what uh, Christy just mentioned, like using fossils is very important. And so, the, the change of morphology caused by develop development as well. And so, here is an, these are the example of like sister species, but you can tell like they, they, are, they look very differently in, from, the, from the outside. Uh, but there's only a tiny shift in the development timing, and, but it creates such big difference. And also, by, uh, by studying the ontology data, we can understand more on the, on the develop, developmental of the uh, organism. And so in this case, we want to understand the intrinsic factors, such as like genetic variation, uh, organism development, and also the extrinsic factors, such as like uh, uh, ecological reasons or like uh, environmental factors and how these things shape the evolution of phenotypes. And to understand this question, we want to collect large scale data set because you know, there's so many uh, species across the taxonomy and uh, across the world. And then so we can measure the phenotypes and traits across the wide taxa. And so the goal is actually to to make accurate and comparable uh, measurements on these uh, either fossils or specimens. Uh, so the, the, the one of the, the most popular ways to, to use digitization techniques and to create like non-invasive and then easy to reuse uh, scans or digitized data of them. Uh, to, so to generate like accurate uh, measurements, like the Angelis group, like previous, mostly just use the uh, geo, uh, like landmarks, like homologous landmarks, and then use uh, uh, geometric morphometrics and proxy, all these uh, classic methods, and then so then she can uh, quantify the shape of uh, the different scans uh, and generate like morphological estimates of, of this specimen. So to do this, like the, the lab group, I think they're all uh, previously was in Andrew's group, and then they travel around the world, and then they they did like loads of scans, either uh, micro CT scans or surface scans, like across more than 2,500 specimens. And among them, there are like 500 of them are fossils. So I think by doing all these 
scanning, like we managed to get like a large scale. I think considered for evolution is quite uh, maybe not as large as like uh, ecological uh, people, but it's also already quite big for the uh, evolutionary studies. And then uh, so this mesh measure so and then we we put landmarks and this measurement help us to understand these questions and which lead to many uh, publications. So here's all the like application based on this data set. Uh, so this data set is basically the fundamental uh, towards the success of these studies. And uh, again, like landmark, landmarks is the essential measurement for this study. But like to collect this large amount of data manually using scanners and placing landmarks manually, it's very time consuming and a tedious job. So our next goal, but we still want to scale up the, the data set. So the, our next goal is try to looking for bigger clays such as insects, uh, but the, the limitation, as I mentioned in the last slide, is like the, the, the way of how we collect, how we digitize the, the specimen. But hopefully with some uh, AI or robotic method, we can speed up the, the measurement speed. And, uh, but the most important thing is the specimens, right? Luckily, we have all these specimen lying in the museum. So it is great, but maybe it is not that great if we're doing all the things manually. Uh, so here's one of the uh, uh, next uh, projects that Angeli want to do, is to use a synchrotron, a diamond light source synchrotron based in Oxford, UK, and then to scan like all these insect collections in the museum, and while using this robot arm to hold and then move the insect, and luckily like insect is smaller. Uh, so I think the, the estimates probably will generate like three, Hundred scans per day, so which I think that will like drastically increase the size of the of the data. And additionally, like people are increasingly share this data, so make it easy to get like more data scans. And uh, so we are working on try to sort out and organize and curate all the the, the scans that scan in UK, and then hopefully we can uh, setting up the mobile source UK soon, and so people can easily access and download all this data. And uh, another goal is to, so speaking uh, after the getting the, the data, right, the, another, uh, the next goal is try to automate the measurement because uh, we were talking about all this AI methods. So we were thinking maybe we can use AI to speed up the, the measurement or the phenotyping and the scan. So one of the projects I'm currently looking at, which I will present next, is to look at the sutures uh, of the uh, mammal skulls. And then you can see sutures here. They are quite like tiny, and then there are like loads of different like uh, categories of sutures. And hopefully, we can use like uh, AI or deep learning methods to uh, either extract landmarks or extract like uh, uh, other measurements such as uh, segmentation, and then use this uh, measurement to generate like uh, metrics for understanding suture shape and the complexity. And uh, yeah, and so thanks for everyone. Of uh, what they contribute to Angelis project and the group and yes so and here I'll give this my phone okay so hi everyone again uh, my name is <laughs> 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 my name is my name is Yichen, and today <laughs> I'm going to present a project that you probably never heard before it's uh, using an uh, AI pipeline to quantify a suture of, of 3D scans of uh, mammal cranial. And, uh, oh. oh, yes. So there have been uh, many studies trying to understand the skull morphology, but uh, I think the current stage is mostly understanding the shape of the skull. However, uh, for example, such a suture or the chamber in the skull uh, have, have received less attention compared to the, the actual skull. Uh, but I, I think suture is quite important because it relates to like numbers of like functional roles, including pre-capturing or feeding. So to understand the suture will help us to understand the evolution of mammals and also like functional diversity uh, among them. Uh, as you can see here, like uh, mammals, uh, like uh, skull, like diverse quite a lot uh, along the, the tree. And so to, to, to measure the sutures, we plan to take four different measurements. First is definitely, of course, the overall skull shape. 
and then so the rest of three are like more suture related. Uh, the second is suture fusion because uh, like different uh, mammals they, they might have like a different fusion of the suture, and to understand this, it can be really in important to know like how say for example how hard the the skull is and the re and the uh, other stuff as well, and then the. The three and four is the suture shape and the suture complexity. Uh, for the complexity at the moment, so I think uh, our previous colleague, uh, she it's has. Like out. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, my my previous colleague has tried to uh, quantify suture complexity only on two D, but uh, I think now we hopefully to expand it to three D because we have all this micro CT scan. Oh, and then to measure suture, so th this is very uh, very uh, simple and naive. So it's like we have different ways of doing them, right? So it's more like overview. So first it's just to, to measure them on 2D and then on the, uh, no, sorry, uh, on the actual specimen. And then this is just an example photo I took before the conference here. Like I, for me, I, I can't even bother to turn on the calendar. Cal <laughs> so it's like to see that's how useless this, not, not useless, how uh, outdated this method is. Because you can only get like a, a 2D, like a very, uh, <laughs> less dimensional uh, measurements and but the second one is maybe on, on 2D images or 2D photos so which uh, my colleague has published uh, some studies on like the, the screenshot of a 3D reconstructed uh, skulls but however uh, although we can get uh, some like really like say higher dimensional measurements but the lack of uh, spatial or 3D information for example like how how deep the, the suture can go into the, the skull is, is lost so then we are trying to seek for a uh, 3D measurement, which is the micro CT. So micro CT is really useful because it captures 3D information and internal structure and it's non-invasive. So here is an example, but it might be slightly outdated because it was shot while the Barbie was uh, on. But it's basically showing like, oh, with micro CT, we, we, can, we, can, uh, we don't need to open the Barbie and see which Barbie we we go and then see if, if there's if any accessory is lost. If if there's if there's something wrong with the quality, we can just exchange them in say in the, in the supermarket. So we show oh okay so too too much of the bargain. Let's get get back to the uh, the actual skulls. So which again it shows really useful to capture all this information internal structure non invasive right and okay so here's the data set we currently have. We have like more than seven hundred of CT scans of mammal skulls and so this. Two stage of, of this of my project is first is just to identify all the sutures in once, in one which I think people introduced a lot yesterday is the semantic segmentation. They are suture or not, right? And the the second one, uh, the next step is try to identify individual sutures because there's like more than uh, forty sutures I think in in mammal skull, and then hopefully like uh, at the end of this project like we can identify them like individually and then to understand them like in a, in more detail, but. So, of, of course, like manually label them is, is time consuming, uh, like because they are quite tiny and subtle, in the, as you can see here in the, in the uh, CT slices. And also like classical methods such as thresholding or say uh, region growing is, is not working well because uh, uh, this suture, they, they have like similar uh, intensity to the background. Say if you do like threshold or region growing or active contour, all this method, it will Easily expand to the uh, to the to the background as well. So uh, I haven't found like a really heuristic or classic way of, of quantifying these sutures. But for example, if we just want to get a bone, I think maybe a threshold or classic method works. But so which in this case, since we have like hundreds of scans, and uh, I think maybe it's time to use AI. So as you know, like for example, like segment anything like the segmentation has been a such. Uh, Big task in AI or deep learning community, like the the very the the, the, the newly come like the most I think the strongest or the very generalizable uh, model like segment anything I think people mentioned yesterday uh, has achieved like lots of success in real world images, but at the same time and there are many uh, methods applied on like uh, medical image. For example, you I think many of them heard UNES right it has been applied to different like. Uh, cross-section, uh, x-ray, MRI, or CTs. So I think it is very promising to try uh, AI on our data. So to first, to make a uh, uh, training set, so it's more like a proof of con concept. So I only uh, select 10 skulls 
and then uh, we ask a domain expert to label every 20 slices within the range of sagittal suture. Uh, so for the manual labeling process, it's, I think it's slightly painstaking. First, it's like you need to draw this tiny bit of the, of the suture, and then the, the second is you need to, the, the second uh, difficult thing is you need to refer to the, sometimes you need to refer to the 3D reconstruction model and then to understand oh is it actually suture or is it not so it can take a lot of time uh, so after manually uh, oh sorry and also so what we label is we label the background the bone so the bone is gray and then the suture is white so it's a three class semantic segmentation task and uh, so for the uh, very initial data set we got like 140 uh, seven slices labeled, and then we try to 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 use it as like initial training set. See if the if the method actually work can can whether it can detect suture. So here's the the ten skulls as selected. I think they look quite varied uh, across uh, the the taxa, and I think probably it will introduce some difficulty for the model. And then here's uh, some of the uh, just give you a, a taste of how. How they look, how different they look in the CT or in the slices. Uh, so obviously, I think the difficulty for human would also difficult for the machine because they are very small and then they have similar intensity to the background. <coughs> so here's the the method I tried. Uh, first, I just split them into test and training sets. So in a eighty percent to twenty percent, uh, like very classic uh, partition. And then the model I try is like UNET and Deep Lab V version three, which are the like classic uh, semantic segmentation uh, architecture. So the but and um, to tackle that suture is really being really small, I try different ways of weighting them. Uh, so first is the same way, and then the second is like to make it one one ten. So I kind of increase the, the weight of suture, and also I add like auto weighting that uh, I automatically calculate like the the proportion of uh, suture inside each. Each slices, and then I kind of assign this auto weighting to the to the model, and then to evaluate, uh, I use size score. It's basically is uh, range from zero to one, one as the highest and zero as the lowest. So it's something like a, imagine it's a combination of uh, uh, the union divided by the uh, oh sorry the, the intersection area divided by the, the union area. So it's something like quite robust score normally used in the segmentation task. And so here are some of our results, uh, like preliminary results. Like the bone, actually, it, it, it does really well. So it's like got like no point, like nine, nine, ninety six percent of die score. Uh, but the sushi has only got like uh, around no point five, which shows I think only half of them are being correctly uh, identified. So here is some of the something I can show you. It's like here is the ground truth. Here is the prediction. So there, I think I identified the two. Uh, mainly two things that uh, the model didn't do well is first it like it tend to over segment uh, tend to over segment the suture see it here is like slightly wider than the actual suture uh, I think it's maybe because it when, when it learned it, it will because the maybe it's something the setting with the weight or something with if the model learned too much to overfit I, I have no have no idea at the moment but and the, the second one is it will segment this holes as sutures like, cause uh, for sutures, it's normally semi-open or like completely open area within the bone, within the skull. But uh, this like a completely closed area within the bone. I think there are more like holes in the bone. But cause again, like holes and sutures, they're quite similar. So the the model sometimes it picks those holes. Um, but I found this if this is uh, there are the, if there are so they there are the the challenges. So maybe. Not only using deep learning, if we can get like some of this uh, result, I can probably do some post processing. So one of the the post processing I do is first, if if a predicted suture area that is completely covered, because it's easy like to do in the competition in OpenCV library. If it's completely covered by bones, then I, I set it as uh, as like holes. So I just remove this part. Uh, if it's completely covered by bone, and then the other one is, I, I I train another model just to just to purely predict the bone. So hopefully I can get like a higher uh, accuracy of bone, which I do. I think got like, but it's like very slightly improvement of the bone. But 
with this only bone and long bone area, I can overlay this bone onto the prediction uh, predicted sutures that that tend tend to help to kind of uh, narrow down the over segmented area. But it, we need to be really careful. But because if the bone is not very accurately predicted, uh, then for example, see here, see here. So they predict this suture as the bone, and if we overlay, then nothing left. So I think we need to be really careful about the post-processing. So here is like the current stage of, of my uh, study, but uh, I, can, I think it, it kind of, kind of shows some potentials. For example, like maybe we can, we can use like AI or deep learning to, to detect sutures. Uh, and, and then if we, if we manage to do that, uh, if we manage to get like an accurate suture, <coughs> we can first uh, generate like 3D mesh reconstruction of the segmented suture, and then maybe probably use this for downstream analysis, such as you can placing landmarks on this, or, or just run some uh, deformation model to, to study like the, the shape variation between sutures. And also, like, I think it's e really easy to calculate the suture fusing. Su suture fusion, if we have this segmentation, right, like the area of the segmentation can just be derived as the, the fusion of the suture. And some of the future work is obviously, I think, like people uh, mentioned yesterday, it's not, it's not uh, the, so to first to tackle this thing, it's not the model that's the most important, it's maybe to get more annotations. Because obviously we only got like a, 147 sizes, that's not enough. So, to, so hopefully we can label more and create a larger training set. And second is, I want to create like a more robust, uh, a harder, say, maybe a real world problem has said, so the, the reason is that currently, uh, of these 147 sizes, right, when I uh, partition them in the model, is so they actually, I think they, have, they, they, they might have slices from the same scan that both in the training set and test set. So which means it might only work <coughs> within this scan, within this specimen. But if we can label like a, just a pure stack of a pure stack of some specimen that the model never seen before, I think it can maybe can, test better and then show like a robust result like how, how the model performs. So obviously we need to more annotation, but it's really hard to find volunteers. I don't know why, <laughs> but hopefully we can get some. But uh, at the same time, we want to de decrease the manual work, right? And otherwise, like there's no reason actually hire me. So, so, with, <laughs> some, <laughs> with some double thinking uh, to increase annotation, but decrease the manual work. I'm thinking maybe we can potentially use oh sorry, potentially use some uh, other ways of training. So the, the the one we currently use and also the most popular one is the fully supervised learning. Just use the manual label to fit in the model. But maybe another thing we can try is use semi-supervised learning. So use this some of the manual label, some of the non-label sizes to fit in the model. Or another way of for semi-supervised is. You use this manual label to predict the model. No, sorry, use this manual label to train the model, and then use this model to predict some of these non-labeled slices, and then add this part into the model. But you need to be really careful because it might uh, kind of inc increase the, the bias and then make it like worse and worse. So you need to like look at the data and the prediction really carefully. But I think the, the third one is maybe something worth to try. is the weak uh, supervision is using Scribble. So instead of labeling the, the whole sutures very carefully, like draw the actual uh, contour, we can just draw like a one or two like a very simple scribble and then use this as, the, uh, as the, the input label and then train the model. And I think uh, one of the paper written by uh, Kai Ming He, which I think his name appeared lots of time, like yesterday, like the, the inventor of uh, ResNet, uh, he also, he, I think he has some paper try to use uh, this scribble to detect like real world uh, images which achieve like those of success. And also there are some applications on, uh, on, on, on like medical image. And for the last one, it's called self-supervised learning. So it's basically just use all the non-labeled like tons, but it, it requires like really large uh, data, data set. It's fit tons of like non-labeled image into the model and then hopefully let the model to learn itself from this non-label data to try to learn like the, in, in, the intrinsic uh, relation or pattern within all this data set and then use this 
uh, self-supervised trained model as like a, a pre-trained way and then to, to do some of the downstream tasks. Uh, I think one of the key example, self-supervised learning, I think maybe more uh, intuitive is like ChatGPT is self-supervised trained model. It's like they, they just got like tons of like ta uh, task, uh, oh, sorry, text uh, extract from the, the in internet. And then they kind of, some of the way they do is they took some of the, they, they just create some task for the model to learn. So you have these whole sentences, right? Like for example, ChatGPT or other large language model, they took some of the, the words from the sentences. And then you fit this like a kind of like non-complete sentences into the model and then let it predict the, the whole sentences, which is creating a task for the model to learn. So I think in the same instance for image, maybe we can, uh, so I think there are some studies like take out some of the, the chunk of the image, like just uh, imagine like a uh, mask them and then use this as an input image and then try to train the, the whole image. It's kind of create a task, let the model to learn without doing like any manual annotation. So these are the potential ways we're gonna try. Uh, so, so the future work is, is obviously identifying like individual sutures. Uh, like, so hopefully like we can apply instance segmentation on these slices and then try to identify like, these sutures into different classes. Uh, instead of doing this, another possible oh, uh, another possible way to do is maybe we can we can just segment straight on the mesh on the mesh data. Uh, some of the study has tried to use segmentation on the mesh model, but they are more like a simple mesh, like there's no internal structure. Uh, so to I, we did a little bit preliminary run is like we try to uh, train uh, mesh CNN. Uh, on the surface scans of uh, skulls and then so what we label is the teeth, the skull and the antler. So I think the, the result showed the, the model is learning and it, it can predict well on, it can predict the antler and the teeth well. So it's some, again like proof of concept, like it, it could work on the um, 3D data of major history collections. But the, the, the difficulty is once we get into the 3D reconstructions, there's so many no noises, so many internal structures. So the face and vertices is like uh, increased just drastically. So hopefully, I don't know, like if we can find a way like to optimize the, this model more, maybe it could just be applied straight on the on the 3D reconstruction, and then maybe to help us to identify individual sutures. And uh, uh, obviously, like we try to put more data. I think like Christy mentioned today, like uh, to get as many data as possible and then make them like AI ready so people and then share it so people can try like different ways and then see if like AI method can have like really well generations on them and uh, yeah thank you very much.